I had tried to vocalize it as best I could, and then I read it aloud. After which Father Lev came to me and said, Father Anthony, I have never in my life heard anything as boring as your talk. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, why? Speak without notes. I said, but you know that I have begun to learn English three months ago. Whenever I open my mouth, I will make a fool of myself. And he answered, exactly. <laughs> then you can laugh instead of being bored to tears. <laughs> and so I have a debt of gratitude to the fellowship for inviting me. And it's sad to think that so many of its members now are in the kingdom of God, but are not sharing anymore with us their faith and the knife. Some Anglicans, some uh, Orthodox of all nationalities, and I think we must try never to forget them. Because without these pioneers of the rediscovery by the English people of Orthodoxy, and by the Greeks, Russians in particular, of the Anglican Church and the faith of the West, we would have been so poor and so narrow and such prisoners of what we believe to be the whole, while it was only a vision of the part. Having said this, I will come to the subject which had been allotted to me. I was asked to speak on Lent. We think of Lent very often, far too often, with a sense that it is a sad period of life. A period when we must restrain all joy, limit everything which is our habitual, pleasurable life. And we forget that Lent is the most wonderful journey. It takes us from where we are, and I will come back to this, to a meeting with Christ risen. And before that, to Christ crucified. Meeting Christ crucified is an experience so shaking, so tragic, at the same time so wonderful. Because Christ gave his life for us in an act of love. We were lost there was no way in which we ourselves could find the gates of the kingdom of God. And he chose to be, as he says himself, I am the door. He proved to be that gate through which we can enter in the kingdom. And this gate is his incarnation, his life, his teaching, but also his crucifixion, his death for our sakes, and the resurrection which was a victory of love divine. So, when we think of Lent, we must think of a long way which we must tread in order to meet Christ is our Savior, to meet Christ who has known <coughs> how to love us to such an extent as to give his life, <coughs> to accept all deaths that we may live by his life. There is a text 
of one of the ancient writers in which the dialogue that preceded creation uh, is uh, imagined in the following way. The father said to the son, my son, let us create a world and let us create man in our likeness. <coughs> and the son said, yes, father. And the father continued and said, yes, but man will fail his vocation. He will fall away. And then you will have to become man and die to save him. And the son answered, Be it so, Father. And the world was created. This is to God, towards whom we move in the course of Lent. Lent is the journey. And the aim of this journey is an encounter. An encounter first with Holy Week, the tragedy of the betrayal of Christ, the tragedy of his crucifixion, the tragedy of his death, of his lying in the tomb, a prisoner of the earth he had created. We are so used to the services of Holy Week and of Lent that they do not shake us in the way in which they could shake us if they were new to us every time. I remember when I was a youth, a group of us gathered on Good Friday in a small chapel in the presence of a priest whom I admire so deeply. I met him when I was a boy of eight. And there is one thing that struck me in him. It is that he could love all and each of us. Each of us, not all as a band of people, as a lot, but each personally. But that his love never faltered, never changed. When we were good, his love was exaltation. When we were bad, it was a searing pain in his heart. But his love never changed. Much later, when I discovered the existence of God and Christ, I understood that he stood for me as an icon, an icon of love divine. And it is with him that we stood in front <coughs> of the Epitaphios, of the Pashinitsa, on this Good Friday. The church was dark. There were about 10, 12 of us. He stood on his knees before the tomb. And then he got up and he turned to us and he said, Today Christ has died for each of us. Let us cry over ourselves because we have killed him and cried tears of gratitude because he so loves us. And he knelt and cried, and so did we. And I have never heard a sermon more powerful that reached us boys at the core of our being, and which I have not forgotten after more than 70 years of life. So, Lent is a period 
a journey. And the aim of this journey is an encounter, a meeting with the God who has so loved us that he chose to create us in spite of the fact that we would kill him in his humanity. And the wonder that we can meet this God and be received by him with his unfaltering, unchanging love. Who of us is capable of meeting another person who has been instrumental in killing something in him or killing something that is infinitely precious to him? He can. When we meet him, we meet him, the risen Christ. Yes, but as one of the fathers of the church has put it, until all things are done, until the end of the world has come, when we meet Christ risen, we see the wounds of the crucifixion on his risen body. And these wounds we have inflicted and we are inflicting Every time when we are unworthy of being human, of being creatures of God, loved into existence by one who knew what it will cost him. And it is about this journey that I want to say a few words now again from another angle. <coughs> we all know the parable of the prodigal son. But we never try to place ourselves at one point or another of this parable. To begin with, the son lives happy content, possessed of everything one can dream of in his father's house. He is loved, he is secure, he is wanted, but he has heard that there are ways in which one can be happy and satisfied and fulfilled in ways he has no idea of in his father's house. Isn't it worth trying? And he turns to his father and says, I will put it in words that are mine. Father, I am young, and you are not that old. I cannot wait patiently until you are dead to inherit all that you have earned through <coughs> ceaseless efforts, through a long life, let us make an agreement. Let us agree that as far as I am concerned, you are dead. Die and give me everything which I would have after your actual death. Then you can continue to live. You have my brother. But I will be in possession of your inheritance. And the father doesn't say a word of reproach. He does not accuse him of ingratitude, of anything, not even of folly. He divides between him and his brother, all he would give to his son when he died. 
and he knows that as far as his son is concerned, he is dead. His son has preferred him dead rather than alive. Now, when we think of ourselves, we have been loved into existence by God. We are sustained in our existence by love divine. And at every step, we say to God, step aside, give me free passage. Living with thee, living according to your will, be always faithful to being a true son of yours is too much. Step aside. Let me pass. I want to, to follow my inclination. And Father, let us go. Each of us can reflect on the way in which he says to God, Time and again, within one day or within one's life, it doesn't matter. I want something which is not you. I want something which will satisfy me, my imagination. Let us agree <clears throat> that you, for a while at least, I will ignore your existence. You will not exist anymore so that I can be free to enjoy life. And then the boy leaves. He drops his robe and dresses up in garish clothes, what he imagines will be the clothes of the town, of another milieu, of other people. And he goes. And the father stands, and he probably holds this robe which the boy has dropped to his heart, and he sees him going away. Going away without even turning his head, without waving his hand, simply going. The father, the home, don't exist anymore. He has a whole world in front of him. And then he comes to another world, a world of amusement, of wealth, of relationships that he had not known before. And as long as he has got the money taken from his father, He is surrounded by the goodwill of people. Oh, he has friends. As long as they can take something from him. And he is totally satisfied. He doesn't think of home. He is totally engrossed in the life which is his now. Isn't it our situation so often when we get carried away by something which is not God's, which is not even our own best self, which is ugly, even to our eyes when we stop to look, but we don't stop to look. We don't want to remember him whom we were in the Father's house. But gradually, the money is spent, and the friends who had no use for the boy in himself turn away from him, look for other friends who are rich, who can share these riches. And the boy remains alone, alone, 
He has no father left because he has renounced him and turned away from him. He is ashamed. How could he go back in repentance? A vow, what he has done, his unfaithfulness. Isn't that what we do time and again? Even when we come to our senses, do we turn to God and say, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. We try first to put things right somehow so that we can return to the Father to our true vocation without shame having somehow made a reparation or put things sufficiently right but he is hungry and no one wants to help him because no one has any concern for him and so he finds work he finds work looking after pigs, so the swine, impure animals. Humans are no longer there for him. Normal, ordinary beasts of the farm, no, they are too good for him. It's a swine who are as impure, as unworthy in the eyes of the people as he is that will be his companions. But the swine know how to feed themselves and he does not know how to feed himself the swine way. And then he comes to rock bottom. He's hungry. His clothes fall to pieces. There is no hope for him left but a hungry death of the beggar. But the beggar may hope that something will be given him, but he can beg, no one wants to give him. They recognize in him, him who was their generous giver and who is no use to them anymore. Why should they feed him? And at that moment, he realizes there is only one person in the whole world to whom he can turn, the person to whom he said, you are superfluous in my life, die. And who said, Amen, I accept death for you to be free. He realizes that a greater love, a greater compassion, a greater openness of heart he cannot hope for. And he started his journey. Do we start on our journey like this when we realize that we have come so low? Step by step, do we start on our journey? but not trying to dress up and come back to the Father dressed so that we can be accepted. No. In rags, hungry, without anything. Because we can trust His love. And we know from experience that putting on Clothes does not make any difference to what we are inwardly. And so he walks and walks and he repeats a confession which will present to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Accept me as one of your hirelings. A hireling. He will be, he will have shelter, he will have clothes, he will have food, he will not be ill-treated, 
He will not be contemptible. He will be like so many others, safe. He doesn't ask his father to recognize him as his son. But at least give me a corner in the hirelings' hearts. You remember what I said in the beginning? That while the boy was going away, having thrown down his peasant's clothes, his robe, the father probably stood holding it to his heart. It was all that was left of his past with his son. He comes now in rags. And, his, and the father does not stand by the door waiting for the boy to come, kneel down before him, ask for forgiveness. How many times did he come out to see, doesn't my boy come back? Oh, if you only came back, oh, I would be so happy. Oh, how I would look after this poor, poor benighted little boy. Every day, several times a day probably, does the Father come out. The way in which God come, stands waiting for us to come. Christ, crucified and risen, the Father waiting for us to come, brought back by the only begotten Son. And this time, he sees in the distance a vagrant. And in him he recognizes, oh, not with his eyes perhaps, but with his heart, his son. And he rushes to meet him. And he embraces him. And the boy starts his confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven against thee. I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. At that moment, the father stops him. He may be an unworthy son, but he cannot become a worthy hiring. Nothing can destroy the link there is between the father and the son. He is his son, worthy or unworthy. He embraces him and doesn't allow the last words to be spoken. And then he turns to the servants and says, <coughs> Bring him his first robe. One can interpret this passage differently. Often one says, bring him a beautiful robe so that he can dress and drop these clothes, torn, dirty, he wears. No, I don't believe it is that. What he says, bring here the robe he wore when he was my son, which he dropped when he left the home. Bring him that. And they bring it. And the boy puts it on. And he looks at himself in amazement <coughs> because clad in this robe, he is the son that left Somehow, the years or months of betrayal are over. This robe is a testimony that he's a son, he's at home. Can we come at the end of this journey to meet our father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against thee. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. <coughs> Can you receive me? This is what happens when we come to confession. A confession is a moment when we come to the God who has loved us to the point of giving his life, of dying on the cross 
for the love of us. It's not someone who stands there to judge us. It's someone who rejoices. He's come back. He's back. Oh, we must wash his feet. We must give him food. We must give him his first dignity, his first robe. He's now back home. I have a son again. I always had one. But he has a father again, whom he had renounced. And then we enter into a new, a renewed relationship. Not the old relationship that ended so tragically by the son saying, I can't wait for you to be dead. A new relationship. I know now. I have understood now. I have come back. Oh, Father, I can call you Father because you have called me your son. I think these are thoughts which I want to leave with you for these weeks of Lent. If you reflect on this parable, not as something that happened to others, but as something which step by step relates to you. Today you will be the boy who says, I want my freedom, and turn your back on the father. And you know, turning one's back is something terribly definitive. I remember Father, um, Professor Zander saying that when two, per, two friends quarrel, as long as they are face to face, they see one another. The moment they turn their backs to one another, even if they still feel the shoulder blades of the other, they are infinitely far because they look into an other infinity. Let us see, step by step, where we belong. At what moment of this parable do we belong? No, not in general. But today, at this hour, in an hour's time, before we go to bed, when we wake, when a new day <coughs> starts for us, and if we do this, we will be able to walk step by step along that road which is Lent, which is a road from sinfulness to encounter. Not to, to, um, to sinlessness, but to an encounter with the, with the Father. And within this relationship, new life. The life of the risen Christ, which is prepared to share with us.